My name is Carmen Bold. I'm the oral historian at William & Mary. It's currently around 12 o'clock p.m. on January 17th, 2019. Staying with Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, class of 2000, in her office on Capitol Hill. So if you could just start by uh, quickly restating your name and stating your place of birth and your date of birth. Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, um, n uh, born September 16th, 1978, in Saigon, Vietnam. Great. And what years did you attend William & Mary? I attended William and Mary from uh, 96 to 2000. Wonderful. So can you tell me a little bit just briefly about where and how you were raised? Uh, I was born in Vietnam and um, my family and I escaped communist Vietnam when I was about six months old and um, we, we escaped by boat and when we got to international waters we ran out of fuel and so a U.S. Navy ship um, rescued my family. They provided us with food, fuel, and water. It gave us what we needed to make it to a Malaysian refugee camp. And from there, a Lutheran church in Fredericksburg, Virginia, sponsored my family and relocated us to um, uh, Fredericksburg. Um, I grew up in Fredericksburg and then moved to Northern Virginia for high school, um, where I applied for college and, and went to William & Mary. Sure. And how did you decide on William & Mary? What was that process like? I had applied to um, both UVA and William & Mary and had received um, comparable um, academic scholarships and financial aid packages. And so it was down to those two schools. And I went to visit William & Mary on one of those rare, um, really beautiful weathered days. Um, uh, sunny, clear blue skies. And... Um, the campus just felt like home, and I uh, met with um, uh, some of the professors, and I talked about the opportunity to do a Monroe uh, project mm -hmm. because I was a Monroe scholar, and um, I just sort of knew that uh, this that William and Mary was the right place for me. Great. And did you know what you wanted to study going into it, or did you decide that once you got there? I did know that I wanted to um, study economics and international relations, East Asia, so those were my um, double majors. Um, I had been given advice, I think, when I was applying for schools that, um, that I should pick a technical skill mm -hmm. um, in, a, to, uh, in addition to the international relations piece, um, and so that's why I chose economics. Um, and. Uh, it has actually served me really well. Um, it has given me a framework for how to think about um, the world, and, and um, I've used sort of that education all along the way in my various uh, different careers. Wonderful. Were there any professors or advisors or mentors that were particularly impactful during your time at William May? Yeah, Professor Rogers was my econ um, honors thesis advisor. And I remember my senior year, he had been appointed as the chief economist for the Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. And he would work in D.C. during the week, but be back on the weekends to uh, continue to advise his honors thesis students. And um, he'd always go for a run late on Friday evening. And I knew that if I was in the computer lab, um, he would swing through to see which honors thesis uh, students were there and help us um, with, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, regression modeling or just basically help us work on our thesis. So my Friday nights were in that spent in that computer lab working on my thesis, waiting for him to come through um, uh, in his uh, running clothes, basically, <laughs> to work on my thesis with him. Wonderful. So Friday nights spent working on honors thesis. Uh, yeah. um, what favorite memories do you have of your time at William & Mary? Things you did for fun? Uh, what was most enjoyable about William & Mary to you? You know, I think, like I mentioned, my first um, visit to William & Mary was like a beautiful, clear, blue sky, sunny day. And then when I got to the college, it rained an awful lot. Um, and. Uh, so some of my favorite memories are when we would have those really beautiful days, you know, like a, an unusually warm fall day or that first day of spring where, you know, we were finally coming out of winter and being um, in the sunken gardens. Uh, I was a part of Chi Mega and, um, 
you know, a lot of great memories with uh, uh, being a part of that sorority too. Sure, wonderful. So if we're switching gears, um, thinking about difficult moments or harder times at William Mary, are there any in particular that have stayed with you or stand out thinking back? Hmm. Harder moments, well, I think writing my thesis was probably one of the hardest things. Um, I'm not naturally a computer computer scientist, and uh, or I wasn't doing computer science, and um, I had to code the regression models, and it that was just... That's why I spent Friday nights in the computer lab. It was just really hard, um, but uh, you know it was worth it. Um, I got to graduate with uh, honors, uh, economics honors. So. And were there any ways in particular you felt supported or alternately not supported during your time at William & Mary? I felt incredibly supported at William & Mary, both the professors and my um, fellow uh, classmates and my sorority sisters and just my friends. Um, William & Mary is just a really special place because it is this very tight-knit, small community, mm-hmm. and um, it was a great place to go to college. Sure. Um, so if I could ask what the experience of, or I should say, part of the focus of this interview, or most of the focus is really on 100 years of co-education and what that experience has been like for women. Um, also, we focused over the past year on increasing diverse voices in the historic record because the record at William Mary is very white, very male, very cis. So we focused last year on 50 years of African Americans in residence. And I like to ask about race relations and gender relations on campus at any given point in time because I want to see how that's changed and, and what's developed over time at William Mary. So during your time there, um, do you mind reflecting a little bit on the experience of being a Vietnamese American woman on campus? I guess the late 90s, uh, the college wasn't that diverse, mm-hmm. um, thinking back on it. I had the real honor of being the convocation speaker this fall. Mm-hmm. And I remember standing up there and looking out at the student body and thinking how much it had changed in the time that I had gone to school there. But I don't really, I don't really remember anything feeling all that different, Mm -hmm. uh, just because the community was so welcoming. Um, I can't think of a moment where it played a negative uh, role. So you mentioned you were going to school in the late 90s. How did you see it's the nationwide, worldwide, even statewide sociopolitical climate or things that were occurring at that time play out on campus? Well, I, rem- I, I remember that was Bill Clinton. Um, one of those campaigns was while I was there. It might have mm-hmm. been my freshman year. Um, and, um, you know, for me it was the first time really engaging in political debate um, on the freshman hall with other um, classmates who had clearly formed their own political opinion and I didn't really have uh, that kind of political you know political mindset and I remember the, that campaign um, talking about those issues and um, debate debating the different perspectives um, I'm trying to think of what else was going on that that, uh, that in those years. Yeah, so during that period of time, I mean, just some big things that happened in national news. I mean, we're, we're seeing the AIDS crisis unfold, um, the Oklahoma City bombings, there was a the Chicago heat wave that killed many. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the Clinton administration, there was O.J. Simpson trial, yeah. um, and then you actually like bridged Y2K, the, the Y2K oh, that's years. Right. So I don't know if anything like that stands out as something that uh, struck campus particularly. Well, so in the late 90s, everybody is just now getting email access, sure. and we would still go to um, the computer lab to check your email, but you didn't you didn't rely on it so much, so mm-hmm. you'd go every couple of days to check your email. And thinking back on that, that's kind of astounding to me because I don't know that I go a couple hours uh, without checking my email these days. Um, And I remember um, because we were just beginning to start that technological um, uh, revolution or uh, that we saw in the 2000s, um, the prospect of uh, Y2K loomed really large. Everybody, there were all kinds of, um, uh, you know, theories that 
disaster was imminent. Um, I remember taking a class on, uh, it was a sort of a religious, um, it was based on um, uh, the Bible, but basically uh, uh, the end of days, a study on the end of days um, that fall, um, because it was so present on people's minds of what would happen when we shifted into the new um, millennia. Wow, that's wild to even think about. But, um, <laughs> yeah. You survived it. Everyone yeah. survived I two K. So that's it was almost think. like a letdown, right? Because it was there was so much sure. buildup, and then we were all alive in two thousand without, you and know, going right back to classes yeah. and spring semester. Well, so I have just a couple more questions for you. I know you're very busy, so we can transition to your time post William and Mary. Um, would you mind just talking about how William and Mary, your experience there has played out in your life and specifically your professional trajectory, where you went following William and Mary and how you landed where you currently are? So when I was at William and Mary, I did an internship with um, the Scowcroft group working for General Scowcroft. And he had been the National Security Advisor for George H.W. Bush. And um, in that capacity, I developed relationships with people in his um, office that I still, uh, to this day, or I still consider them mentors, and they still help me with my career. Um, and it was a, a taste for me of what it was like to work in international um, uh, relations and kind of see the world more globally. But I'll never forget, he was my commencement speaker. Mm-hmm. So after having done an internship with him um, during my sophomore, summer of my sophomore year, um, after my senior year during at, he was the graduation speaker and I'll never forget he talked about the importance of public service in his um, graduate graduation speech and he said that the future of this great nation laid in the hands that were at the helm of state and that was why it was important to have good people in public service and as somebody who is a refugee who and an immigrant to this country, I was so grateful for all the opportunities that I had received. And I remember sitting there in the audience thinking to myself, oh, I've made the wrong choice because I was planning to go work for Deloitte Consulting and I had accepted the offer in the fall. I'd known all of my spring semester that I was going into business consulting. And I remember sitting there at graduation thinking, oh my gosh, did I make the wrong decision? And I think that speech and that idea of public service and the importance of it um, sort of stuck with me while I worked at Deloitte. And I worked for Deloitte for two years, and 9-11 happened um, uh, just a little over a year after we all graduated that spring. And it deeply affected me. Um, I remember spending um, days just uh, with my roommate, uh, a a classmate and a sorority sister, we were living together here in Northern Virginia. We were all just glued to the TV and also our phones waiting to hear from classmates that were um, missing in New York. And it made such a deep impression on me. Um, and those words that he spoke at my graduation um, made me decide to leave the private sector and go back to grad school and to go um, seek a career in public service. And so that's how I ended up um, at Georgetown and then in the office of the Secretary of Defense um, working on national security issues. And it was incredibly gratifying. I only, I loved my job I, uh, in OSD policy. And I left the job because my husband got a chance to run his own business in Florida. Um, and uh, uh, there really wasn't an opportunity for me to continue to do that in Florida. So I went back to the private sector. Um, but I think you know, we moved to Florida, I'm working in the private sector, and 2016 comes along, and I'm still the patriotic person who's committed to public service that I was when I left Deloitte to go work um, at the department. And I'm hearing in the 2016 election, you know, rhetoric that doesn't comport with an America I know. I'm seeing dysfunction in government, and, um, and then the Pulse nightclub shooting happens, and it became another one of those moments where I thought to myself, you know, um, he's right. It matters who's in public service. Like, and so I got into, um, this race four months out from a November election. I decide to challenge a 24 year Republican incumbent, um, 
because I really believe that you had to change the kinds of people you were sending to Washington in order to change the way Washington works and mm -hmm. have it serve the people better. Um, and I ended up winning in November, and that kind of leads us to today. But, you know, William & Mary uh, gave me the skill set and I think also the uh, passion for public service um, that has kind of carried me in, in, um, through my career. Wonderful. Time for one more question? Yeah. Okay. So I've mentioned a couple times on this and before the interview that this oral history interview is part of this whole initiative um, to celebrate and commemorate 100 years of co-education, 100 years of women um, as students at William & Mary, which is incredible and amazing and still so short in the grand scheme of William & Mary's history. Um, so I'm, well, in addition to that, actually, you are the first Vietnamese American woman to be serving or to be elected to Congress. And so given these themes and given um, just the climate that we're in at this moment in United States history, do you mind telling me what you believe to be the value and contribution of women, uh, maybe at a school like William Mary, but also at large? I think the value and contribution of women is uh, innumerable. Um, uh, you know, whether it's uh, from the aspect of being uh, moms and sisters and wives and you know just being a part of the community but I found that the voices of women um, in the halls of the Pentagon or here in Congress or in the, at the board uh, room have been incredibly important mm -hmm. in ensuring that those organizations um, reflect uh, different perspectives um, and particularly here in Congress, I think it's really exciting that this uh, 2018, uh, our, uh, what is it, the, 200, uh, the 216th Congress, uh, or I'm sorry, the 116th Congress um, has so many women, a historic number of women have joined Congress. And I do believe that in a democracy where it is supposed to be representative government, that our elected officials should represent the diversity of this country. And so there's a gender diversity there, but there's also racial diversity. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to see our government kind of begin to start to look like our country. Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you for answering all that. Is there anything else you'd like to add at this time? For this I think that's it. Well, thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank you it so much, so much. Carmen. I appreciate it.